Hey, this is Patrick Sullivan. Welcome to my shop. Today I want to show you how to make a small lathe that takes up no permanent space in your shop, requires no new motors or power tools, and costs just a few pennies. It's perfectly adequate for dozens of small jobs, and the best part is, when you are done, it disappears. The drive for the lathe is an electric drill that you already own. The rest of the lathe is made from scraps that you probably have lying around your shop. The components clamp to your workbench, which keeps everything aligned and provides lots of mass to damp out vibrations. The head sock is essentially a small box adapted to clamp an electric drill. Here are its parts. Two sides, a top, a bottom, and a drill bed. The base has a strip glued to the front edge to align it with the workbench. I use 3 quarter inch or 18 millimeter plywood to form the parts of the box and all the bases. I'll include the important dimensions in a drawing on my website. The headstock is 7.5 inches long or 19 centimeters. Next, cut rabbits in the sides. These create strong joints, but more importantly, they make it much easier to glue the box up and keep it square. The rabbit at the bottom is the thickness of one piece of plywood, while the rabbit at the top is the thickness of two pieces. We'll cut a small opening in the front side and the bottom, big enough to easily accommodate the clamp that holds the headstock firmly to the workbench. I cut these openings on my scroll saw, but the shape is not critical, and lots of other tools would do this job. The hose clamps that hold the drill onto the headstock must be located so that they grip the drill solidly and avoid the trigger and the ventilation openings. Each drill is shaped differently. We cut shallow notches in the edge of the top and the drill bed to enclose the clamps. The notches on the underside of the top should be rounded because the hose clamps bend sharply at this point. Mark one end of all the parts clearly to avoid gluing them up in the wrong orientation. We have to cut shallow notches in the edges of the rabbits of the sides to create a pathway for the clamps. It may be hard to visualize why this is necessary, but trust me, it is necessary. Okay, now we're ready to glue up the headstock. Lay out the pieces and double check that they're all pointing the right way. Apply glue evenly to all the edges. Clamp it up and check that it's square. I cut a thin strip of wood about four millimeters thick, or a little less than a quarter inch, to run along the underside of the top. This is not strictly necessary, 
but it prevents the hose clamp from deforming as much when it's tightened, and it reduces play in the clamp. Next, I cut a very shallow V-shaped trough in the drill bed to support and align the drill. Each drill is shaped differently, and this must be customized to the drill that you will be using. The drill bed also needs notches in its side to match the notches just below it in the top. Thread the two hose clamps through the notches and bring them up the other side. It's much more convenient if the screw that tightens the clamp ends up facing the front of the headstock. Attach the headstock box to its base with screws. Be sure to keep the box exactly aligned with the edges of the base. Set the drill in place on top of the drill bed and look for places where you can glue small blocks that will keep the drill perfectly centered and straight. Next, put a long drill bit or a length of long rod into the drill chuck and test that it sits parallel to the workbench. If it does not, then add some shims until it does. For the tailstock, we'll cut these small support pieces first, and then the upright second, and after they're glued together, we'll cut the notch. We can establish how tall the upright needs to be by measuring the height of the center line of the drill. The upright needs to be about an inch or two and a half centimeters taller than this measurement. Then clamp the pieces together and set them on top of the base to mark exactly where the tailstock's center shaft will go. Chuck a very tiny bit in the drill and use it to make a centering mark so that the headstock and the tailstock will exactly align. Then take it apart and drill the hole for a 3 8 inch or 10 millimeter threaded rod or bolt. This hole needs to be a little smaller than the rod because we will thread this hole. Use a drill press or an accurate drill guide to drill this hole as straight as possible. Glue it all together, being sure that the three pieces sit flat and evenly on your work surface. Tap them with a the hammer to be sure that they are square and even. In order to cut threads in the hardwood of the upright, buy another bolt of the same size. Using a thin abrasive disc, cut three grooves in the threads of the bolt. I try to slightly undercut the threads on the leading edge of each groove. The grooves need to be deep enough to contain the tiny amount of wood removed as the threads are cut. The only trick in actually cutting the threads is to get the tap started straight and true. Be careful to keep it exactly upright for the first three or four turns. The tailstock needs a pointed end. The pointed center on many commercial lathes is approximately 60 degrees, so I cut a scrap of MDF to guide me as I ground away the point on a strip sander. You could do something similar with any other power sander or even a drill press. We're going to make three wheels for this lathe and they could be made from solid wood. However, it's easy to make super high quality hardwood plywood for these small shapes. Cut thin strips of any suitable hardwood, about an eighth of an inch or three millimeters thick, and then cut them into squares large enough to accommodate your wheels. Glue them together with ordinary PVA glue, with each layer at 90 degrees to the ones above and below. Always end up with an odd number of layers. Clamp them evenly.
There are lots of ways to draw and shape these wheels. For this large one, I just drew the design directly on the wood using a compass and a straight edge. However, my preferred method is to design them on the computer, print out a pattern, and then glue the paper pattern directly on the wood. The circular dents around the side can be cut with a Forstner bit in a drill or with a scroll or saber saw. For the two wheels of the tailstock, there is really no need for great precision. While we are at it, we'll make a small wheel which will later become the, the drive spur. It's about 32 millimeters square or one and a quarter inches. Drill a tiny hole in it to mark the center. Then use a Forstner bit to make a recess which will just fit a nut or a bolt head. We will anchor the bolt and the threaded rod into the wood with epoxy. In order to keep the metal shaft square to the wood, I cut a little block of MDF and drill a hole through it with my drill press. Cover the block with kitchen wrap, then push the rod or bolt through the hole and press the MDF guide block firmly against the wood wheel. For the tailstock locking wheel, I drilled a recess a little smaller than a nut and marked the six corners of the nut around the hole. I then cut flat sides that form the corners with a small chisel. It takes only a few minutes and the drill hole helps to ensure that the nut will sit flat. A little epoxy will lock this nut in place. For the tool rest, I began by gluing up a block of wood using some scraps that I had available. The shape and the dimensions of the rest are really not very important. However, what is important is that the tool sits on the rest so that its cutting edge is very close to the center line of the spinning work. While the block is still square, drill it for the screws that will hold the base in place, but do not put the screws in yet. Cut a slot in the top to hold a steel strip. The depth of this cut will determine the final height of the tool rest, so measure and mark it carefully. Then cut away the wood on both sides of the steel bar to make room for your hands on the outside and for the spinning work on the inside. Drill the steel bar for two small screws. Then insert the bar into the wood and use these two holes as drill guides for the wood holes. Use the same bit to start the holes and then change to a smaller bit to finish them. This will ensure that the wood holes are correctly centered. Finally, screw on the base. There are lots of ways to make a drive spur, and I've tried many of them. I now think that making them out of hardwood plywood is probably the easiest method. First, chuck the spur blank into the drill, set up the tool rest, and then turn the wooden end round. Sand it smooth. Rotate the rest and turn the face flat. This ensures that it's square to the shaft. Mark two perpendicular lines through the center and make a shallow saw cut in both. Then take a hacksaw blade, either new or used, and cut down through the saw cut until the blade is about three quarters buried. Now we cut up the same hacksaw blade into four little squares. Sharpen one edge of each square on the abrasive disc.
wrap a strip of packing tape around the wooden disc to act as a dam for the epoxy. Cut a small nail to the right length and tap it into the center hole, cut end first. Put a small amount of epoxy into the four saw cuts. Then dip the bottom of each hacksaw square in epoxy and insert it into the slots. Push them down until they bottom out and are about the same height above the wood. The pointed nail should be slightly higher than the blades. Now mix a larger batch of epoxy and spread a uniform layer over the entire face of the drive spur. Help it to level itself by spreading it out with a toothpick. We want enough to support all the metal pieces firmly. Once the epoxy has cured long enough to be quite firm, maybe an hour, remove the tape and trim away the sharp edge around the perimeter. Okay, we're done with the basics. Now let me show you how this works in action. Clamp the headstock and tailstock against one edge of your workbench. Cut a blank of wood and mark the centers of both ends. Make two very shallow saw cuts in one end at 90 degrees to each other. Press this end onto the drive spur and advance the tailstock screw into the center mark on the other end. Continue to advance the screw enough that you anchor both ends firmly. I'm going to turn a handle for a file or a chisel as a demonstration. First, rough the rectangular block into a cylinder. I'm using some very simple carbide tools that I made. I mark the pattern directly on the wood and use a parting tool, also homemade, to make some deep cuts. The shape of the handle evolves very quickly. If you have some experience, it might take three to five minutes. If you're new to turning, it'll probably take longer. A professional turner could probably do this handle in two minutes. Most of the shaping is simply done by eye. You cut until you have something that pleases you. It's a lot of fun. You can sand right on the lathe, and you can see how rapidly you smooth out any tool marks. Vacuum up the shavings and sanding dust, and then you can apply finish right on the lathe too. This is shellac which dries in minutes. You can buff it smooth with a 3M pad and apply several more coats. The finished handle is very smooth and very uniform even though the entire finishing process took only a few minutes. I think it looks pretty professional. I hope I've convinced you that this tiny, cheap, lightweight lathe can handle lots of small jobs and can do it rapidly. But most importantly, it disappears when you are done. If you're new to turning, I strongly recommend that you watch some of the hundreds of excellent videos on this subject on YouTube. Wear a face shield and treat all power tools, including this one, with the respect they deserve. If you like this video and you want to see more, continue subscribing to my channel. Just click on my picture in the upper right corner. If you'd like to see some other small home shop tools that I've made, check out these two links below. Thanks for watching.